Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. I'm Rachel Wright, and in the early hours of Wednesday the 20th of December, these are our main stories. Israel's president says this. Israel is ready for another humanitarian pause and additional humanitarian aid in order to enable the release of hostages. A UN vote on a ceasefire in Gaza is delayed yet again to get the US on board. And anger about the plight of children in war-ravaged Sudan. Also in this podcast, China is hit by a large earthquake as Iceland's volcano erupts. And... There's a wonderful recipe which sounds fairly lethal. George Washington in the 1790s, he served his eggnog with uh, rum, whiskey and sherry in it. We get into the Christmas spirit by looking at some famous drinks recipes. A vote on Gaza at the United Nations Security Council in New York has been delayed yet again and won't now happen until Wednesday at the earliest. Negotiations are continuing about the wording of a resolution as global calls for a ceasefire intensify. Israel is refusing to consider one and it continues to have the backing of the United States, which has used its veto at the UN to support its closest ally and block a ceasefire. The U.S. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said that Washington would stick to this. We don't support a permanent ceasefire at this time. It would simply validate what Hamas did on the 7th of October. It would leave them in power in Gaza, which is unacceptable to us and to our Israeli friends. And of course, it would give them um, a, a much longer timeline to prepare and plan additional attacks. We do support smaller, more localized, more targeted humanitarian pauses to get hostages out and to get more aid in. But the UN wants to show the world it can reach an agreement on the war which has killed around 20,000 Palestinians in Gaza, according to the Hamas-run health ministry there. The UN also wants to get more aid to civilians. To do this, as the Security Council is trying to agree a resolution calling for a suspension of hostilities, which could have the support of the US. But our correspondent, Neda Taufik, who is at the UN in New York, said this wasn't straightforward. This time, the United States requested that the vote be postponed as negotiations continue. And I actually asked the Deputy Ambassador Robert Wood just a short time ago if the United States is on board with this resolution. And he said that it is just too early. They are still working with the key players on this draft, and they will see how negotiations go this afternoon. But speaking to other diplomats, there are two key issues that the United States still has with this draft. Even though the language was changed to a suspension of hostilities, there is still a phrase in there uh, calling for urgent steps towards a sustainable cessation of hostilities. The U.S. does not want to see that in there. It's uncomfortable with that language. They are also getting concerns from Israel about this U.N. monitoring mechanism that is being proposed to streamline aid into Gaza. Israel feels like the mechanism would prevent them from controlling and inspecting properly the delivery of humanitarian aid. And so those are the key sticking points. And it is why, despite diplomats thinking they were so close on an agreement, that we are now seeing this vote postponed continuously to try to bridge those gaps. Well, it's been more than two months since Hamas broke out of Gaza, killing more than 1,200 people in southern Israel. Around 120 hostages are still believed to be held in Gaza. Israel's president, Isaac Herzog, had this to say on Tuesday. Israel is ready for another humanitarian pause and additional humanitarian aid in order to enable the release of hostages. And the responsibility lies fully with Sinwar and the leadership of Hamas. Our correspondent in Jerusalem, Hugo Beshega, listened to what Mr Herzog had to say. Interesting choice of words by the Israeli president talking about a humanitarian pause. The Israeli government has been rejecting any kind of proposal for a ceasefire. The Americans have been supporting this view and they have been rejecting growing international calls for a ceasefire in Gaza amid 
concerns over mounting civilian casualties and also over the humanitarian situation in Gaza with the UN and aid organizations warning of a humanitarian catastrophe. But it is also interesting that pressure is also growing domestically for the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, especially after those three Israeli hostages were killed by mistake by Israeli soldiers in Gaza last week. And the families of the hostages who remain in captivity in Gaza, more than 100 hostages, are now urging the government to engage in any kind of negotiations with Hamas to reach a deal for more hostages to be freed. And uh, families are saying that time is running out for these captives to be freed alive. So there is a lot of pressure on the government. What is interesting is that Hamas is saying that no talks are going to take place unless the war stops. And we've heard a number of times from the prime minister, from top uh, Israeli officials, that the goal here is to not only guarantee the release of the hostages, but also to guarantee uh, the elimination of Hamas in Gaza. Hugo Bushega. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has rejected a suggestion that his country could be starting to lose the war against Russia. At an end-of-year news conference in Kyiv, he admitted that Ukraine faced challenges, but said he was confident his allies would not let the country down. Here's our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams. Ukraine and its leader are facing a hard winter. President Zelensky revealed today that he's considering costly proposals to mobilise a further half a million people. It comes as commanders report ammunition shortages across the long front line. Packages of US and EU support to Ukraine, military and economic, are stuck, probably at least until the new year. Mr Zelensky was asked by the BBC if he thought there was a danger Ukraine was losing the war. We don't control the skies. We don't have enough ammunition. But that doesn't mean that we will not find a solution. But for this, we really need support, because we simply lack some weaponry. It's President Zelensky's job to strike a defiant and positive tone to try to rally his country. But earlier this year, there were big hopes of a breakthrough with an eagerly anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive that in the end hasn't done much to change the front lines. Asked about a reported rift between the president and his top general, Valery Zaluzhny, Mr Zelensky insisted the two still had a good working relationship. On the question of how long the war might take, the president said no one could answer that. But Ukraine, he said, would not be let down by its partners. And what if Donald Trump returned to the White House after next year's US presidential election? Mr Zelensky said he didn't think US policy would change. But if it did, he acknowledged this could have a significant impact on the war. Paul Adams. Meanwhile, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has told a meeting of his top military officials that he would be prepared to talk about the future of Ukraine with Western leaders. But he said his country would not give up what was theirs. After its invasion last year, Russian forces have claimed four additional regions of Ukraine. Here's our Russia editor, Steve Rosenberg. At the Russian Defence Ministry, a minute's silence. Army chiefs and the commander-in-chief, Vladimir Putin, honoured Russia's war dead. Nearly two years after the full-scale invasion of Ukraine that Mr Putin had ordered. In his address, President Putin was defiant. He argued that in Ukraine, Russia had gained the initiative, despite Western assistance for Kiev. Attempts by the West to inflict a strategic defeat on Russia had, he said, been shattered by the courage and persistence of Russian soldiers. He claimed that Russia didn't want to fight NATO or Europe. But it's clear that when it comes to Ukraine, the Kremlin expects any peace to be on Russia's terms. His so-called special military operation has not gone at all to plan. But the Kremlin leader can sense growing Ukraine fatigue in the West. He will have noted the difficulty President Zelensky had in trying to secure a fresh aid package from the Americans. He knows there's a chance that Donald Trump will return to the White House. That's why he's sounding confident. Steve Rosenberg in Moscow. 
At least 127 people have been killed in one of China's deadliest earthquakes. Measuring a 6.2 magnitude, the quake hit the mountainous Gangsu province. While power has been restored to the region, icy conditions threaten rescue efforts, with more than 700 people reported injured. The number of people displaced remains unclear, but many residents are now faced with harsh conditions. I have never experienced something like this, and I'm 70 years old. I've never experienced such a big one. I'm afraid. Now I have no place to live. In my home, there isn't a single room left intact. What should I do? Now we have nothing. We can only wait for the rescue workers from the government. Earlier, I spoke to our Chinese media analyst, Kerry Allen. So there's a lot of media in China stressing that this is very unusual for an earthquake to happen in this region. It's in the northwest of China. The earthquake has spanned across two provinces known as Gansu and Qinghai. And a lot of houses in this region are not built for earthquakes. And it's quite a densely populated region. So this has really been a, a factor in why there's been so much damage, not only because of this, because a lot of houses have collapsed. Also, there's a lot of mountains. So there have been mudslides and landslides. And also just factoring in the time of year as well. It's extremely cold in these regions. We're talking temperatures of around minus 15 to minus 9 degrees Celsius. And where are people expected to shelter then? As you say, over 5,000 buildings have been affected and it's really cold. Well, one of the good things is that China has a very large population of 1.4 billion people. So when something like this happens, it's able to mobilize people from other areas. Firefighters, the military, police come in to be able to help out and police dogs as well. So this has been the big focus in state media today. There's been a lot of attention on relief workers rushing to the area and being able to help out. And what I've been watching on CCTV, which is the national broadcaster, is tents being set up for people who have lost their homes. So there's been a lot of footage of this today on television. Obviously, sometimes it's difficult to find out what's really happening on Chinese media. Would you say that this is a little bit more transparent? Yeah, well, I think it's because it's a developing story. And also China's had lessons learned in the past from previous earthquakes. There was a major earthquake back in 2008 in an area called Wenchuan in Sichuan, which is a southwestern province in the country. And lots of people died then. And there is commemoration of that earthquake every year. There is an acknowledgement in China that earthquakes can be very devastating, again, because of China's very dense population. So yes, I've seen lots of live streams running today, really trying to to bring people information on the latest and really just to show how much the government is doing. I mean, we have to factor in as well, this is China. So it's a country that is dominated by state media that really want to paint the government in a very positive light. So a real emphasis on what the government and the authorities are doing to help is very much dominating media coverage. Kerry Allen. Now here's a story with a warning for anyone finding old things in the attic. A second-hand dealer in France has won a case to keep more than €4 million from the sale of a rare African mask he found in an elderly French couple's attic. The dealer, who's not been named, was taken to court by the couple who sold him the mask for €150. They wanted the sale stopped, arguing that the dealer must have had prior knowledge of the mask's true value. From Paris, here's Hugh Schofield. The couple, both in their 80s, were clearing out a house and the dealer took a load of bric-a-brac off their hands for a nominal price. Among the items was a wooden mask, which the couple said had been brought from Africa by an ancestor. The dealer then had the mask valued, was told it was in fact an extremely rare object of which only a few others were known to exist, and at auction last year it went for a monumental 4.2 million euros. The couple then went to court, saying they'd been defrauded because the dealer must have at least suspected the value of the mask. But the court ruled that no, it was just the dealer's good luck. It was the sellers, the judge said, who were actually at fault because they should themselves have done due diligence and had the mask looked at by experts before they decided to sell. You, Schofield. It's less than a week until Christmas, and to help you prepare for your feasting for the days ahead, we are focusing on drinks. James Cooper is a Christmas expert and talked Sarah Montague through the history of some hot, festive tipples. 
The earliest records of warming wine and putting some spices in it, which is basically what mulled wine in, goes back to the Romans. And it's thought that they probably took their wine from Italy when they were travelling around France and Spain and brought their warm wine with them up into Northern Europe. We've got an early record in a medieval English cookery book from 1390 of a mulled wine as well. But then it sort of disappeared and during the Anglo-Saxon period and onward to wassail which was sort of mulled beer with apples and cream. And it's where we get some of our customs from, like toasting, because it was the communal bowl of wassail, and it means good health in Anglo-Saxon. So you go out to the apple orchards, you'd march around the apple trees, making some noise, singing some songs, scaring away the evil spirits, waking the apple trees up for the harvest, and you'd pour some of the wassail over the roots to give them a feed. But you'd also put toasted bread in them. And you might even lift up a bit of the toast from the wassail bowl and put it in the apple trees. And that's where we get to raise a toast from. Wow. And the basis of it is beer, is it? Yeah, it was a mulled ale that you added curdled cream and then you roasted apples and sometimes your eggs, cloves, ginger, nutmeg, that sort of thing. Eggnog. That's not so common, at least this side of the Atlantic, any longer. Where does eggnog come from and why at Christmas? Yeah, we, we now sort of think of it as this sort of vaguely strange American import, but it started in the UK. It was a medieval drink that was hot milk mixed with wine or ale and spices. And it was given to you when you had the cold or the flu. It was also known as a posset. In the mid-1700s, it was really picked up in America and taken over there. And they got more into the sherry and brandy and rum side of it and made it their Christmas drink. There's a wonderful recipe, which sounds fairly lethal. George Washington in the 1790s, he served his eggnog with rum, whiskey and sherry in it, which sounds fairly potent. (laughs) James Cooper speaking to Sarah Montague. Still to come, the DNA evidence showing how people travelled around the Roman Empire. It's hugely interesting uh, how he came to be from the edge of the empire to end up his life in a Cambridgeshire ditch. The worst child displacement crisis in the world. That's how the United Nations describes the situation in Sudan, where the war between the army and the paramilitary rapid support forces has driven more than three and a half million children from their homes. Many have been caught up in the recent escalation in violence, with the rebels advancing into Wad Madani, south of Khartoum. Our correspondent in the Horn of Africa, Kalkadan Yibatal, told me more about the significance of this. It had hundreds of thousands of people from Khartoum, from other areas, that were pushed out of their homes. So it had this large displaced population. And now as the violence is reaching into this city, these people are finding themselves on the move again. So according to the UN, hundreds of thousands have fled the city already. And statements and remarks that we managed to find from aid agencies suggest that people are, you know, scattered in all directions without any area that they're supposed to arrive at. So they're moving with their clothes and little on their backs and fleeing the city on foot. This war is terrible for everyone, but as the UN has pointed out, it's particularly terrible for children. Yes, this conflict has been one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world right now. Seven million people in Sudan are displaced. More people are seeking refuge in neighboring countries like Egypt, Ethiopia and Chad. And among those people that are impacted are a huge number of them are children. The UN's children agency, UNICEF, was saying that children are disproportionately impacted by this conflict and it seems that the situation is likely to worsen rather than get better. The Sudanese forces and the government say that the UAE is backing up and supporting the rapid support forces. What evidence do we have of this? There are reports of increased influence by the UAE in the Horn of Africa region, not just in Sudan, but in countries like Ethiopia and even in Chad as well. The Sudanese armed forces, senior military officials have been very adamant and they used strong words in accusing the United Arab Emirates of providing weapons to Chad and uh, providing other military equipment to the rapid support forces as well. The UAE, of course, denied these accusations that brought diplomatic spats between the two countries and they expelled Sudanese diplomats from their country and the Sudanese did the same letter as well. But one thing is certain and that is the United Arab Emirates' influence is growing across the Horn of Africa and it seems that it's going to continue to do so. Kalkadin Yibotal. 
It's a volcanic eruption that could last months rather than weeks, at least according to scientists in Iceland who are studying the fissure which broke open on Monday night. The nearby fishing town of Grindavik was evacuated when intense seismic activity indicated that an eruption was imminent. Bjarni Benediksen is Iceland's Minister for Foreign Affairs. He told the BBC how significant it is. Suddenly around nine o'clock last night, we had a big earthquake and just a little over an hour later, the eruption started. It is a much larger fissure than we have seen in the past three years where we have had smaller eruptions. But luckily, it is in an area which does not threaten at the moment uh, the town of Grindavik and it does not threaten infrastructure. Our correspondent, Sofia Petitza, is in Iceland and sent us this update. The authorities are urging everybody not to come to this area for their safety, but also to allow scientists to assess the situation on the ground. We can smell the smoke, we can see ashes in the air, we can sometimes feel the the vibration under our feet and we can definitely hear the sound of the volcano in the distance. And just to give you an idea of the situation, when we were in Reykjavik, the capital, which is about 30 kilometres away, we could immediately see the orange flames coming out of the volcano. And that gives you an idea of just how powerful this eruption is. In the last few hours, I've spoken to several people who have come here to take selfies, take photos, take videos of the volcano, but they're all tourists. There were people from India, the UK, the US, who thought this was an amazing view that they did, they did not want to miss. But then I spoke to somebody from Iceland and I asked him, you know, are you concerned? Are you scared? And he just looked at me and said, this is just a regular Tuesday for people in Iceland. The authorities had been preparing for weeks. There's a town nearby that had been evacuated weeks ago and so what the authorities here are saying is that they are fully prepared there is no threat to life and that they are hoping that the people who live near the volcano will be able to return home soon. Sophia Petitza reporting on a regular Tuesday in Iceland. At the height of its power two millennia ago, the Roman Empire stretched from the north of England to southern Egypt and from Armenia in the east to the shores of Portugal in the west. And it seems that people moved around a lot. New DNA analysis proves that a 2,000-year-old skeleton found in Cambridgeshire in eastern England is of a young man who lived in what is now Ukraine. Our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh, reports. This latest research marks the conclusion of a detective story, one which has used cutting-edge forensic science to unravel the mystery of an ordinary person, a young man buried in a ditch in Cambridgeshire between 126 and 228 AD during the Roman occupation of Britain. Researchers extracted DNA from a tiny bone in his inner ear, which was the best-preserved part of the entire skeleton. They were able to establish that he was a Sarmatian, a nomadic people from what's now southern Russia and Ukraine. Roman documents show that five and a half thousand of them were recruited to the empire's cavalry because of their horse riding skills and posted to Britain. But according to Dr Alex Smith, this is the first biological proof of their presence here. It's hugely interesting how he came to be from the edge of the empire to end up his life in a Cambridgeshire ditch. We're starting to see these people in the countryside that come from all different parts of the empire. It says that there was much greater movement, not just to the cities, but also in the countryside than there ever was previously. The new scientific techniques tell the stories of ordinary people rather than those of the wealthy and powerful who usually dominate the records of great historical events. Palab Ghosh. Critics of the recent COP28 climate summit in Dubai say it was a toothless deal, full of loopholes which in fact failed to realistically phase out or even reduce fossil fuel use. But others point to the fact that the deal struck by some 200 countries did promise to transition away from fossil fuels. One of the main people pushing for more to be done to tackle climate change is the US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. Celia Hatton has been speaking to him. I think the deal is historic. I think it's a landmark decision with profound implications for the simple reason that that it's extraordinarily difficult in international affairs to get almost 200 countries to come together, some of which produce gas and oil and don't want to change. 
but everybody signed on to say we must transition away from fossil fuels. To bring almost 200 nations together to transition away from fossil fuels and then add all these other initiatives, I think it's one of the most significant COPs I've ever attended. The key now is implementation. There are some who contend that the language in the deal simply isn't strong enough. It was watered down too much in order to achieve consensus. So, for example, a climate scientist like Michael Mann, they're disappointed with the final agreement, which stops short of a commitment to phase out fossil fuels. Michael Mann says it's like the doctor telling you you have diabetes and you say you will just transition away from having donuts. What would you say to that? I would say I respect Michael Mann. I've followed him and listened to him, and he's a great advocate. But I disagree with him. What is the difference between everybody saying we're going to transition away? Away is away. You're gone. Yeah, but transitions. Wait a minute. No, you have to transition. There's no choice but to transition. You can't just stop it tomorrow. Every economy in the world shuts down. Every person driving to work won't have gas. Of course it's a transition. You're never going to get... 200 countries, a lot of whom drill for gas and oil and sell it in the world. Do you think they're going to sign on and say tomorrow we're not doing it? No. So we have to do this with a reality check. But what is happening, I assure you, I know this, I've followed this for years, is a rate of transition that is growing. Is it fast enough today? No. Is it big enough today? No. But I do know that everything I'm seeing happening is bigger and faster than it was last year and the year before it. They're just a whole bunch of things which will move us faster than if we hadn't gotten agreement. How would people like that? Is this deal enough to keep 1.5 alive? No, not yet, but it's very close. When we began in 2021, we were headed to 3.7 or 4 degrees of warming on the planet. Because of Glasgow and because of Sharm el Sheikh. The IEA came back and said, if you do everything you promised to do, you would be by 2050 at 1.8 degrees or 1.7 degrees after Sharm el Sheikh. Now, with all of the additional promises that are on the table, we have the ability, we think, to achieve 1.5 or very close to it. I'd like to focus for a moment on what is going on inside the United States. U.S. crude oil exports in the first half of this year averaged just under 4 million barrels per day, which is a record high for the first half of a year since 2015. A third of the world's planned oil and gas expansion, right up to 2050, will occur in the U.S. So how will the U.S. meet its climate change goals? Well, we're going to meet them. And that's a tailing down. Ultimately, that's a tail off. We have six years between now and 2030. Regrettably, demand on a global basis is extremely high. And what about demand inside the United States? Well, it's also very high. It's uncomfortably high, but that is changing. U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, speaking to Celia Hatton. On the 16th of August, Shannon Coggins, Theo Simon and their daughter Rosa left the south of England to begin a 16,000 kilometre journey to Sydney in Australia in order to attend the wedding of Shannon's sister. Sounds kind of normal, right? What makes their journey so remarkable is they wanted to get there without flying because of its impact on the climate. So how did they get on? James Reynolds caught up with Shannon and her family for the BBC. My sister decided to emigrate to Australia 16 years ago, four years after I gave up flying. I've been saving up money to come and visit her ever since then. So when the wedding invitation came through, it's 